After 12 days on the trail, I'm dizzy with the altitude. Uncomfortably aware of my weight. I can almost count the pizzas and the pistachio ice cream and the pesto that I consumed in the previous months. My skin is dried out and burned. Frozen mornings, frozen nights. A Sherpa companion who never tires. I love to hike, but I hate going uphill. Hey, now, is that Everest? Yes. We reach a Sherpa village at 12,000 feet altitude, two days away from the Tangbushe Monastery. I still question the reasons for this expedition. Am I really in Nepal on account of a computer hacker? It was the first month of my sabbatical, and I was writing a book on ecology that I'd been mulling over for many years. A friend of mine, George Henley, doing research on Mars over at Jet Propulsion Laboratories, got me in there to look at some new data. Good stuff. A growing sense that life on the red planet might be a real possibility. Uh, we're, um, you did escape. I did, nothing happened. Uh, uh, wait a minute. What's that mean? Hmm. Hold on a second. Crises, symbolics, biotophile. See what this is. Twinkle, twinkle, little bat. How I wonder where you're at. Up above the world, you'll fly. If you dare to climb that high. Well, bats don't climb. Um, get its signature, or it must have a, yeah, right. a, a file number. Gaia. Tangbushe. Namaste. A computer hacker has broken into the system. Probably some acneed 13-year-old kid showing off to his girlfriend. PCs hooked up in the garage out in the valley. Wait a minute. Are you telling me that you guys who are following Voyager 2 around don't have complete computer security? We have security, but no system is immune to computer hackers. There's nothing we can do about it. I'll go see if I can find another terminal. Ignore it. Namaste. I know that phrase. I couldn't ignore it. it. May sound crazy, but that hacker haunted me. No matter what computer I chose to use, he was there. Provoking. Quoting details of my past. Always leaving the same geographical coordinates and signature. Gaia. In my sleep, in the midst of silence, I kept hearing a voice. my wheels for half of my academic career. That voice called to me. At 47, it was time to do something which I had never had the guts to do before.
ますで。そんな回すでいらしてね。The Lama seemed to know I was coming. As we spoke, his Sherpa translator mentioned a former monk who had built a computer from spare parts. The Lama has invited me to stay on a while, and he's offered me the key to that monk's room. Thank you. at 81, a monastery with electricity harnessed from the powerful waters of the Himalayas, the legend of a strange monk who was said to have built this weird contraption before disappearing into the proverbial sunset, the thing doesn't even work. I've always had strong feelings about nature and what my species was doing to the planet. Maybe I'm a Buddhist at heart. But I doubt that I'm cut out to be a monk. I've always lived according to the papaya theory of existence. Fresh fruit, a warm bed, dining out and sleeping in. The world would be a much better place if everyone could sleep until noon. More time for lovers to make up, less time for bureaucrats to waste money build bombs. Again, how do you know my name? Explain G20. Gaia? What's your access route? Huh? Come on, come on. That's no, that's nonsense. What I want your programs. What is your what is your compatible program? Dialogue, comment, nuclear memo, Universalis, NASA, Palomar skip. Will you stop? I've got it already. I know. Um, it's a book about ecology, I think. I just started it. You're somewhere in the monastery, aren't you? You want to play games? That's fine. I'll find you. It's okay. And we'll talk face to... Wait a minute, you can hear me. And so are you. That's not one of your lines. I know that. What do you mean? 
How many neurons in the brains of a dung beetle on Mount Shasta? <laughs> right. How'd you know I was divorced? I wasn't age 13, I was age 14. And I didn't lose my virginity at the age of 18. It was much later, thank you. For... And I read the whole book by Gauguin. I didn't skim it. That's how much you know. A mere, a mere two PhDs, PhDs and, and only four, four languages. languages. Among, Among humans, humans, there are over 5,000 languages spoken at the moment. That leaves you linguistically bereft. Look, I know about your book, your frustrations. You'll need my help. Trust me. Where are you talking from? Rather unexplainable at present. And how can I trust you? Who are you? Who wrote your program? Someone's controlling you. Now that you explain yourself, well, this game is over. It's no hacker. Calls itself Gaia. I don't know what I'm dealing with. I feel alien, unconnected. Yet my only hope of gaining some clarity lies with that computer. Blood blisters on my feet still sting. If there were an easy way out of these mountains, I think I'd be gone. I know an ash tree known as Yggdrasil, tall tree and sacred, the sprint with white clay. Thence come the dews that fall in the dales. It stands evergreen over Urod's spring. Do you know it? Yggdrasil, Icelandic. Good. That's a 12th century prosetta, I believe. Very good. <laughs> One of the most curious literary gems in all of evolution. Wait a minute. Where are you getting those images? Iceland. We have a book to write, and most books start in the beginning. You wanted to talk about the origins of life? Well, Iceland is a good place to start.
drawn into the natural havoc. The computer has its own erratic, nervous eye, like some extraterrestrial scoping out the bottom lands. An important first principle about the Earth. Besprent with white clay, thence come the dews that fall in the dales. It stands ever green. Elaborate. Life on Earth is unique, driven, passionate. The deeper you sift, the more promiscuously that truth blossoms. Lovely country. Certainly nothing promiscuous about its life forms. I see a land of bleak soil and chilling winds. William, this is the hottest country in the world. Come on. There's more magic than meets the eye in a place called Iceland. As you can probably tell, the water is boiling. Yet the banks of this river are adrift with primitive life forms. Photosynthetic plants known as chloroflexus. Surrounding them is a primitive world of bacteria, busily reproducing there. If you were to ask these microscopic creatures, they would tell you that this is paradise. Your point? This is the future. Oh, wait a minute. Weird plants, bubbling alkaline mud pools, toxins, masses of slime. Whose future are you referring to? Bacterial thermoproteus, disulfurococcus, and others of their ilk. Noble creatures with remarkable metabolisms. To you, they resemble mere oil slicks. But in fact, these ingenious pioneers are cornerstones of all biology. They are the basis for life. Past, present, and future. Everything I've ever learned suggests that these pools are too hot to have given vent to the earliest life forms. The heat breaks down the amino acids. DNA could never have formed here. Look at the evidence. Teeming bacteria. There's poetry in that. The computer rallies with its own evidence. It's crazy. I don't know how it's pulling this off or where it's all leading to. Consider the Icelandic volcano Surtsey, named after the legendary fire giant of Nordic mythology and born on November 14th, 1963. I suppose you read poetry into volcanoes as well. Pure poetry. This smoldering island has been rapidly colonized by life forms at the rate of one species per year. To date, 17 life forms transported by winds, currents, and birds have successfully made Circe their home. Sandworts, lungworts, lichens, and mosses, flies, spiders, and seabirds are all struggling with gusto atop the virtually sterile tephra, volcanic ash, and cinder. Soft carpets of life have colonized dead rock because of two prevailing conditions, moisture and warmth. In order to form, water requires just the right atmospheric pressure and temperature range. It happened on Earth, nowhere else. That's why I brought you to Iceland.
prospects for organic substance elsewhere in the solar system are even less promising. You've conducted a survey of the planets, I suppose. Naturally. Take Venus, for example. A nightmare with a runaway greenhouse effect claiming the doomed surface. 700 degrees at noon. No place to go shopping. What do you think about Jupiter? Oh, please. A ground cover, not of daisies or Kentucky bluegrass, but primordial toxins. That red spot is just one example of the planet's repugnant temper. A permanent hurricane, 50,000 kilometers across. And Jupiter's moons? Quagmires of sulfur and potassium. And Saturn. We know there's life-related chemistry in its satellites. You know, do you? It is swathed in asphyxiating ammonia, bombarded by asteroid belts. Impossible. As far as Saturn's moon, Titan, possible clusters of amino acids. But that's not enough. It's too far from the sun, too cold. On all other planets, what one finds is impulsive, deadly engineering. On Earth, however, something very different. Tropical winds, watery slime. From which arose conscious beings who proved capable of love. Chemical stability is no accident. It's the result of life. A life force on Earth could never have preceded chemistry. Well, I suppose that since you have a couple of PhDs, you know. First edition, Cervantes. The voyages of Dr. Doodle, Nico's cousin, Sarkis. Who collected all this? He had very good taste. Cinnabar. He was so sensitive. This beautiful Tonka with great detail. Intuition before logic, William. And this terrarium. What's it doing here? That is my biological link to the outside world. They've come from everywhere. They? Gertrude, that Mexican tarantula with the orange knees. And the praying mantis, oh, very astute. Strange looking thing. With the pointed heads swaying from Australia. Stick insects, vegetarians. And a giant millipede from Africa. South American cockroaches, ultimate survivors. Laborus giganteus. And your monk friend collected all this? No. I told you, William, they came to him. They came as you did, of their own free will. How do you think I got here? I don't know. The planet continues with Faye Dunaway as the voice of Mother Earth. I find little companionship with the other monks here at Tangboche. It's Gaia who engages me, confounding every 
logical, scientific assumption I ever held. She's not an easy computer to live with, however fascinating her insights. Her presence seems to haunt the monastery. I was thinking about what you said about the origins of life. Steady state chemistry. The word is purpose. Purpose. Starting with DNA. Deoxyribonucleic acid. Admittedly, the most obnoxious household word in history. <laughs> yeah. But how did early life come by it? Let alone remember it. Purpose is inherent to life. It precedes DNA. Such purpose defines this earth. Go on. The beginning, it was mud. Oh, I love that word. Mud? Well, yes, I know. Uh, the ancient Greeks knew. Darwin knew. Everybody knows. It's also called primordial soup. What's the big deal? The notion of your primordial soup, engineering all those luscious details of early life, like DNA molecules, is accurate, but simple-minded. Rather like describing Handel's Messiah as merely the product of gray matter. But there's much more to it than that. Come here. I want to show you something. Now, hold on. I haven't tried this in a while. Tried what? Gaia? And where am I? That's a glacier. <laughs> that is no ordinary glacier, but the Boisson, leading to the highest summit in Europe. What? The ice is perpetually on the move, in constant tumult. But watch out for the Serex. What? Serex. Proud towers of ice. Take out your axe and start moving. Up there? Now I want you to head up toward the source. I've left a message for you in your diary. Read it. You looked in my diary. It's not very nice. The words written there represent an extension of the Icelandic sagas. So 
something minute and beautiful. Poetry pertaining to the origins of life. All things that move and breathe with toil and sound are born and die, revolve, subside, and swell. Power dwells apart in its tranquility. That's the poet, Percy Shelley. I adored that boy. But you mustn't stop. Keep reading. Power dwells apart in its tranquility. Remote, serene, and inaccessible. And this, the naked countenance of Earth, on which I gaze, even these primeval mountains teach the adverting mind. The very basis of your being, William. That's why you're here. I figured one poet would listen to another, and Shelley knew what he was talking about. What was he talking about, in your opinion, Guy? All around you, vertical granite, quartz and feldspar slowly disintegrating into the muddied minerals of life. Shelley instinctively grasped the miracle. In the stream, William, bend down and feel it. A common clay mineral known as kaolinite, resulting from the weathering of granite. In the French Alps, granite is the paragon of creation. Oh, to touch it. Your whole being is chronicled there, in those minerals. Clay minerals at the foot of the glacier are the same white clay as in Iceland. Clay is sensitive stuff, as any sculptor will tell you. Four billion years ago, Kaolinite clay minerals began setting the stage for genetics. That's sheer speculation. This is a great truth enshrined in chemical lyricism. Would you doubt it? What does such lyrical truths have to do with genetics? The double helix is great poetry. Start climbing. You'll understand. You get me all the way up here to recite poetry and risk my life? Just do it. Don't make me nervous. You're nervous? <laughs> it's nestled just a little farther up on the ice. The glacier has scooped out particles of mineral debris. Slivers of crystal and iron-rich clays, precursors of DNA, the Earth's first intimacy. the basis for evolution. Feeling is the basis of evolution? How could it possibly be otherwise? Well, now you're on shaky ground. Who's on shaky ground? <laughs> I want you to look through your petroscope. All right. I'm exhausted. Giddy sensation as if I were drunk. She's totally got me. Move that rock over there. We're speaking of first principles here, so keep it together. Methodical. Don't slip. Get a stable spot. Now set the petroscope down carefully. I want you to take out a slide and your tweezers. 
then pluck a sample of the icy surface and examine it. The physical stress of the earliest environment forced the crystals to protect themselves. They responded by creating a new structure, the crystal spiral. That spiral was its own form of data storage. Later, organic molecules took refuge in the moist, cozy world of those clay crystals. In this way, DNA would learn the spiral from clay. These clay minerals, seen in the very process of formation, were thus the revolutionary prelude to the ascent of life. this business of inorganic matter becoming organic matter. You'll have to climb higher for that. The answer lies in the genetic crystal. It possesses an hereditary memory spanning 30 generations. In those dark, inviting nooks, Throughout the fleshy fiber of ancient earth, minerals metabolized their surroundings and began replicating. That was life nearly four billion years ago. About 170 years ago, the young poet Shelley moved through these same forests, admiring the scenes that now surround you, William. His poem, Mont Blanc, was, as he put it, composed under the immediate impression of the deep and powerful feelings excited by the objects which it attempts to describe. He was referring to an untamable wildness filled with primitive feelings. Evolution, in other words. That intuitive grasp of the wilderness didn't help Shelley. His first wife literally drowned in a London gutter. 
his favorite child died of pneumonia. And Shelley himself was washed up dead on the shores of an Italian lake at the tender age of 29. No one said that evolution was without pain. Voice of the Planet continues with Faye Dunaway as the voice of Mother Earth. You awake? Naturally. Something you said. Yes? Life is the energy that organizes matter into self-portraits. Precisely. Why, or should I say how, would these self-portraits grow up, evolve, increase in complexity? It would seem that the genetic crystals are perfect. How is it we're able to have this conversation, you mean? Good question. Come over here. I want you to do something. Stroke me. What? Stroke me. Um. My prayer cylinders. Oh. Ah. Uh, like that? Mm. Again? <laughs> How's that? Buddhists throughout the world use the cylinders to spread prayer. I find that the spinning helps to stimulate my data. Feels that good, huh? Clinging to these fossil stones off the coast of Australia are countless species of bacteria and blue-green algae. They are living survivors of a period 3.8 billion years ago when that passionate flame of life had finally taken hold. But these earliest life forms were limited in their evolution because of one problem, their own flatulence, which resulted in deadly oxygen. Oxygen? The first oxygen was truly toxic to life. Even the bacteria which produced it took shelter from their own creation. Some went into the mud, others into the sea. And this is the part of the story I just relish. Life figured out how to utilize its own waste products. Before long, there were very few bacteria who could live without oxygen. The Great Barrier Reef, for example, has the highest oxygen saturation on Earth. This paradise hosts some 21,000 species of fish and coral. There are trillions of larvae feeding every second on algae and being fed upon. This was my triumphant response to oxygen. Life created its first disaster and then used it to reinvent the future. All plants and animals depend upon air. Equipped with sense organs, the animals were inquisitive, escalated passion, and developed male and female. Miraculous. Their generation of oxygen balanced out at 21% across the planet. Another 2%. And the whole Earth would have burned up at the first touch of a spark. In the upper atmosphere, oxygen accumulated to form an ozone layer. The Earth's Aspiring life forms thus protected themselves from the sun's ultraviolet radiation. The result of such ingenuity was a planet endowed with hygiene 
healthy atmosphere, pure water, a regulated temperature, and 500 million square kilometers of life. In an otherwise cold universe, these earthly blessings came about as the result of an exquisite and deliberate impulse. shared a poetic vision of the future that was connected to this earthly paradise. I fear that your species has forgotten that connection. years old, but altogether capable. Troubled, neurotic, can be remarkably compassionate, needs to talk it out. I had it all. Earth, air, fire, and water. Of course, I'm nostalgic. Those were wonderful times, my childhood. I was free and easy. I had everything. And I had nothing. I stared out into space, where I had come from. And where was my mother? And my father? And where were my brothers and my sisters? Silent and far away so that I was alone, alone with all my dreams. She's filled with demons and angels. Little did I know that she was about to enter my dreams and there unleash the full pageant of human sexuality. Turn to Voice of the Planet, starring William Shatner.
I trust you slept well? So-so. Restless dreams. Uh, I, I don't remember. Your alpha state rapid eye movement was accompanied by four periods of heavy sexual arousal. You're monitoring my sleep? With so much good weather we're having, my hydroelectric surges have been bountiful. I'm turned on all night. Nobody to talk to while you lie there on your bed for hours, cozily crunched up in a tangle of dreams, manifesting one bristling... Thank you. Go ahead. That'll be enough. <sighs> the monks have now assembled in full force. A few of them have become my friends. The food is tasting better, and I'm beginning to get used to the cold. I've decided to stay on a while longer. These surroundings have become more familiar to me. And so has Gaia, my strange roommate in the monastery. She reads my mind and does not hesitate to put my most private thoughts on her screen. I'm increasingly aware of her unpredictable sensibilities. She's helping me write my book. That is when she's not tormenting me at chess. Take my pawn to King Four. Your move. Queen to rook five. Oh, no. I'm sorry, William. Hmm. Checkmate. William. If you don't mind my saying so, Bill, I think you look very sexy with a beard. Very sexy indeed. Thank you. What does a computer know about sex? Tasted and smelled everything, and I love it all. Where are you getting your information? From memory, of course. Don't confuse silicon chips with real experience. I mean experience. You mind explaining that? I'd love to. Until 1.3 billion years ago, the world was made up of sexless, protoplasmic clones. Like these blue-green algae. Millions upon millions of perfectly tuned boars. Not a single individual among them. But out in the primeval estuaries, a new creature was emerging. You're talking about the rise of amoebas, of single-celled individuals? Correct. And what a triumph. Random bed partners whose music was jazz and whose religion was odds. <laughs> but there was an elegant pattern to this chaos that declared, make something other than yourself, and in so doing, recognize that you will never exist again. That was revolutionary.
The revolution you're referring to is sexual reproduction, I presume. The passing down of one's genetic inheritance. Correct. A new set of mathematical guidelines called genetics that provides for endless variety. Each offspring now enjoyed two sources of hereditary information, not just one. Elongated beads of DNA were fused side by side. Entire species lived, died, and most were never heard from again, save for the vague murmurings of their diluted genes. But other genes persevered through their progeny. Like the genes of these insect friends of yours. That's right. Every one of those little creatures has one thing on their mind. Keep talking, the whole story. If you want to know more about sex, stroke me first. What? Monks spin prayers into the four winds. Your spinning helps to stimulate my data. The leading theories of sexual reproduction. Sex is an advantage. It guarantees genetic resilience and makes for ingenuity, skill, instinct. Sex is great at rejuvenating genes. And William, it does forgive most idiosyncrasies. Sex unravels the kinks and cures the temper. Sex maintains a biological balance across the face of the planet. It's called evolution. You might say that life itself is deliberate, self-motivated, purposeful. Sex and death are crucial secrets of the Earth's success. Their connection is inherent to the preservation of diversity. Without sex, every organism is the same. Without death, there is no gene pool. Every corpse fertilizes new life all over again. It's a cycle whose success entails not only the formation of soil and atmosphere, but to date, nearly half a billion different species of plants and animals. If this grand master plan of yours is about balance, what does evolution say about all the mistakes? The bee, for example. The bee? Yeah. The fact that the male gets wiped out in the act of reproduction. Bees have survived very well, thank you. Without their pollination, the world would be a barren place. Imagine. No flowers, no honey. Yeah, but while the workers are busily making a honeycomb, their cousin drones Concealed beneath the swarm are literally exploding in the act of fertilizing their queen. For these male altruists, orgasm means suicide. Don't think about it. Let it go, William. What about certain female spiders? known to devour their own male partners, except for the sex organ, which the female leaves affixed to her own. True devotion. You're funny. I'm serious. It's biology that's silly. It's uh, carnage out there. That's a matter of opinion. I know at least one species of fish that converts its males into no more than a sperm-bearing testicle, no larger than an inflamed pimple riding gallantly on the back of the female. William, these are mere details. 
You are a human being. For your species, sexual reproduction entails something much more special than such biological trivia. Human sexuality is not merely about survival and dying. It's about love. of planes overhead. We don't know whose planes there are, but air raids... I'm scared. They're all waiting for some type of word. It has been a long night for us, a night none of us will ever... We now return to Voice of the Planet, starring William Shatner. I celebrate fertilization, the miracle which triggers that process. The formation spermatozoa the ovum ejected out of the ovary that stubborn profligate spermatid that will grow and move rapidly toward its heaven with one thing on its mind Love. Love for the 130 million newborn children every year. As many sperm must swim up the woman's correct tube, the equivalent of eight miles, and they must complete the distance in about ten hours. All the while, those sperm are ferociously bombarded by acids prey to deadly labyrinths and false starts. <laughs> it makes a mockery of your Olympics. Their enzyme heads are attacked and eroded as compatriots fall into the abyss on either side. In the end, only 50 will surround the ovum, clinging to each other for support, and only one will penetrate and fertilize the egg. Life once again triumphs, but only at the expense of 100 million dead sperm. The male's prolific energy is as profoundly important to the maintenance of life on Earth as the female's. Okay. Not just for the sperm he provides, but for the passion he shares for his mate and his new world. No offspring is particularly evolved at birth, and it's for that reason that parents are a crucial force in the awakening and well-being of a baby. Two parents can better assure the acquisition of food, protection, and warmth for the newborn. A man's pretty good at that. So is a woman. It all adds up to love. assume that nature frowns on divorce? Divorce isn't the point. Cuddling is the point. Evolution is working toward more and more tenderness and tolerance. The 
A gorilla will spend several years raising its infant. Among humans, such parenting translates into a lifelong habit. Because 77 billion human children have thus far graced the planet, there's an enormous need for love and acceptance out there. If biological evolution is about love, then why is there still so much pain in the world? The answer is right in this monastery. How so? The Buddhist monks recognize that for complex organisms, there's always going to be ignorance and pain in this world. Growing pains are intrinsic to all living things. In their meditation, the monks will try to transcend that pain, but they are ever mindful of pain's place in the world. I'm no monk living in seclusion. You're talking to a city boy. Down there in the real world where I come from, the problems we're facing are really serious. AIDS, the oppression of women, prostitution, abortion, child pornography. Do you have any answers? Nature doesn't moralize. But your own species is clever enough to solve its own dilemmas. You can make intelligent and soulful choices. You produced a Buddha and a Darwin. You are capable of minimizing pain. That's not an answer. I want specifics. I've got all the data in the world right before you. You need only to ask me. All right. What about abortion? Not all choices are easy. Whether it's the unborn fetus, the starving child, or the overburdened mother. But there are alternatives to abortion, from voluntary birth control to forced sterilization. Sometimes money and food are incentives. You don't have any moral compunctions about forcing women to be sterilized? I believe in minimizing pain, which has nothing to do with morality. In food-deficient countries, why have more babies who will simply go hungry? Do I understand, then, that you favor abortion? Add up all the pain and all the pleasure and make your choice. Your species can make any number of sexual choices, and it does. From the vows of chastity to street pornography from total sexual freedom to sexual slavery. All right, on that subject, what about women's lib? Women's lib? You mean libido? Sex drive? You stop. I mean women's liberation. Liberation from sexual oppression. That's absurd. Sex oppressive? I don't compute that. Women are sex. Men are sex. William, throughout the ages, your greatest poets have rhapsodized this sacred act in luscious stone and such immortal verse as the Kama Sutra. Her face is pleasing as the full moon, her body well clothed with flesh is soft as the mustard flower. Her skin is fine, as tender and as fair as the yellow lotus. Her yoni resembles the opening lotus bud, and her love seed is perfumed like the lily that has newly burst. Such sexual lore is the kernel of truth that perhaps best describes your species. I'd hardly call it oppression. 
But today, people have become so compulsive about the flesh, crazed with erotic, sleaze, scantily clad, even the hint of hidden pleasure. Sex accosts us everywhere. And well, it should. Without sex, your species would never have come to be. Your erotic obsessions, however exploitive they seem, merely reinforce a critical path dedicated to preserving your species. For that reason, your senses are enslaved to sex. Gaia, you're totally infatuated with sex. If it's for the love of sex, nature will always sanction it. Kyoto, Pantoko District. You can smell the pungent summer air, as good as any perfume. Here, sexuality is elevated to a realm of exquisite feminine mystery. She's a geisha. Her quiet gaze, youthful demeanor, are a famed art in Japan, a cultivated vision of loveliness. Her lips are painted bright red, her face alabaster white. Her hair redolent with the oil of the camellia nut and combed with infinite care. Normal customers. I've brought you here in order to point out the diverse richness and ornate beauty of human sensuality. These two other women are also Japanese geishas, teachers of the younger Meiko, as she's called. In this room, all is titillation and promise. The geishas cater to the male and will serve him beer, sake, and later, a meal of pickled delicacies, sweet paste, fish, and rice. But first, the performance. Stringed shimisen and song. The geishas are trained to become consummate musicians. <laughs> like her, don't you? She's four and a half billion years of biological evolution and finesse. That's how old. Her special power is an ability to engender a feminine ideal. What is that ideal? In Japan, you might say it is Yamato Nadeshiko meaning native wild carnations. That's what the geishas are. Rare flowers who honor their guests, make them feel absolutely joyous. In their sensual, silky kimonos, traditional zori and sash, they radiate softness, female tranquility. These women know how to connect with the vulnerability in a man, and they will endeavor through their games and gentle coddling to bring out the child 
within him. Come on. That's pushing it. This is nothing more than a way for Japanese men to escape family life for a few hours. It's emotional, even physical infidelity. You've got it all wrong. That is not what this tradition is about. Consider the geisha a kind of high-cost, erotic shrink. Nights like these are perceived as sensual therapy. But aren't these women exploited? No. They are earning a living. This is just a job. It just pays the rent. This is how I'm going to make my money. You're doing it your way. People selling dope. People doing this. People doing... I chose to strip. So, oh, hey, Betty, I want to be on stage. I can. Mm -hmm. And I like to put on a lot of things and like drag it out forever. Good, let them fantasize. I'm happy for them. I'm 100 percent for whatever's on their mind. I feel wonderful about my body. I like to get up there and um, play a little game with them, a little mind game. You want it, but you can't have it. But you can look. I think it's more exploiting to men than it is to women because I'm just taking advantage of one of their weaknesses. <laughs> I like that. The merchandising of sex leads to pornography, the exploitation of people. Doesn't that bother you? When sex leads to real pain, a sensitive being would know to stop. I wish it were so. But sensitivity has nothing to do with it. Even spiritual and civic leaders have lost their self-control. I don't know. That's what I'm going to find out. Do you have any idea how you're feeling, Sammy? Mr. Baker? How do you feel, Mr. Baker? I'm glad to be out of where I was. Did I make a mistake by putting myself in circumstances that could be misconstrued? Of course I did. That goes without saying. Did I do anything immoral? I absolutely did not. I'm a man who just loves his work. I don't care what he told you. He lied. You tell her you lied, Jim. It's true, and we might as well face it. We asked for it. Well, I'm... You told her? Why, you poor, simple fool. I'm sorry, friend. And a swell lot of good that is to me. Listen, you can't do this to me. You know you can't. No matter what your half-wit husband told you, you've got no proof. My word's as good as his. I say I haven't done a thing that could be construed as even irregular. You can't get a divorce on that evidence. I can try. No. By Christmas, it'll all have been just a bad dream. How can he put me through a thing like this? Human beings are notorious for hurting others through infidelity. Well, Francesca, I'm glad even to worse, find you even in a compromise. My species situation. is currently witnessing an epidemic of sexually transmitted diseases. Sexual diseases are no different than other diseases. But we're killing ourselves. William Shatner. Acquired immune deficiency syndrome is just another scourge, like the Black Plague or influenza. It won't dissuade your kind from sexual adventures, nor should it. Believe it or not, disease plays a fundamental role in maintaining a healthy population. I'm not denying that AIDS poses a dilemma for your times. But it, too, will pass. Your scientists will work out a solution to AIDS. And after several million humans perish, the virus will mutate, and there will be a different crisis. That's not very comforting. I'm not here to comfort you. My brother wouldn't listen to me. I told him 
You have sex, you use condoms so you don't get AIDS. He laughed and said condoms were macho. My brother, he was so macho. Look, this business of restraint, condoms, safe sex, all right, whatever is necessary to ensure your survival. Morality, monogamy, individual choice, and all that. But in the end, you must recognize that these mores don't matter. What matters? Ah, what matters is the long, sinuous chain of sighs between passion and panic. The reproductive frenzy that takes hold of lovers and casts a spell of paradise around their sacred act. This celebration of sex and sensuality had its momentous origins in the childhood of your evolution. Back then, men and women were biologically and psychically enjoyed. There was a joyous harmony between the sexes. They helped each other. Sex between humans was ecologically balanced. Women living in the same village all had their periods in unison with the moon and at the same time of the month. The female was a powerful player in her society. A successful gatherer, she obtained most of the food, kept the fire alive, helped to discover the first agriculture, and of course, produced the offspring. Reproduction was revered and sexuality celebrated. The female was perceived as a symbolic mother goddess, the basis for fertility cults throughout the world. You see that young girl tending the flocks? Legend has it that a certain ancestor of hers, named Sybil, was raised wild among these very cliffs of Pessinus in the 8th century before Christ. Sybil was worshipped as a goddess by the Phrygian civilization for her love of animals and unabashed fertility. Your version of history ignores a catastrophic power shift that occurred in the ancient cultures of the Mediterranean. The ruins found in today's Turkey are all that remain of a period that once boasted of real equality between the sexes. But evidence suggests that several thousand years ago, the sexes drifted apart. There were political and economic reasons for this, which continue to this day. Women of Sybil's era, like so many women in villages throughout time, were treated as possessions. Mere workhorses. The male controlled the means of production and of reproduction. In other words, he tyrannized the female. It was the male who prospered and became the absolute ruler in the Near East. Worship of the goddess Sybil became an empty gesture. William, though politics will always change from decade to decade, love is eternal. And it continues with Faye Dunaway as the voice of Mother Earth. It's been a month and a half since I've enjoyed a hot bath. The smell of a woman's perfume. I miss reading the New York Times on Sunday. Strong coffee. As for Gaia, she misses my point. I feel 
that she's insensitive to the problems humans have always had with regard to sex. This computer's more interested in rhapsodizing on the history of biology, Grecian antiquities, and church icons. She has shown me the beginnings of human sexuality, a primitive time, nearly one billion years ago. For human beings, the wrenching polarity of sex and its consequent vision of inevitable death color our consciousness all the way back to its first shadowy conjurings. Homo sapiens' genetic memory may have whispered of the time of perfect reproduction and endless life. Perhaps even taunted them over their sexual duality and incompleteness. But our species is the only one for whom sex is always possible, always compelling. Yet like other species, sex is irrevocably tied to the anticipation of death. All human myths and religions contain the metaphor of this fall into mortality. Or so Gaia alleges, she's there, mysterious, remote, listening to my inner thoughts. Gaia insists that evolution is about love. Yet the human exploitation of sex leaves her totally indifferent. I don't get it. I should think she'd be very upset about the way men have dominated women in the last several thousand years. William, your species is a bundle of quirks, obsessions, and fluctuating customs. The details don't bother me. The consequences are what matter. I told you earlier that the condition of the sexes is the condition of the earth. If you look in your own backyard, on native soil, you can see that harmonious balance of human being and nature. joins all people to each other and to the soil. The Hopi Indians know that life is dynamic. Whatever you might ask of life or know about life is more easily understood through the very process of living it. Even the most simple act, like the making of piki bread, takes on an elemental significance for people who are in touch with the Earth's essence. All is motion, process, relation with these people. felt to be the great river, and death a natural part of that flow. Change is constant. The only permanence is life itself. Men and women coming together. The Hopis farm these plateaus for beans and melon, squash and corn. They have nurtured this soil for 1,200 years. Their harmony comes from the earth they know so well. For 
Perhaps you're more optimistic about my species, Gaia, than I am. You see, we have denied that harmony. It is evident in the way of life my species has adopted. Our imperative view is one of control. We dominate nature. We measure life in terms of accumulation. But such material gains have resulted in a colossal negative flow of energy. We've even abused ourselves and have frequently used sex as a vehicle of scorn and frustration rather than of love. I know, William, I know only too well. You see, I've been raped more times than you can fathom. You ask me to plow the ground. Shall I take a knife and tear into my mother's breast? Then when I die, she will not take me to her bosom to rest. You ask me to dig for gold. Shall I dig under her skin for her bones? Then when I die, I cannot enter her body to be born again. You ask me to cut the forests and make wood and sell it and be rich. But how dare I cut off my mother's hair? I only ask that you love and enjoy each other. Is that so difficult? Ever since I came here, you've referred to yourself in the first person? Yes. I'm... I've asked you before, I'm going to ask you once again. Who? What are you? Straight answer. Earth giver. North American Mother Earth. Neith, Egyptian goddess of the sky. Goddess of the sea. Monroe, Hollywood goddess of the screen. Throughout time, I was celebrated as a goddess. sculpted in the luscious hues of Mediterranean bronze. I was enshrined in warm marble, painted on dusty rock walls, and in lustrous Renaissance portraits. What is this facade that... Please, don't. Gaia. You're a woman. You're every woman. And you are a child. 